good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, at this uh, amazing day at the InfoBIP Shift 2022. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. This is uh, a, in, an in-person episode of our uh, Coffee with Developers we have at the We Are Developers here. Um, an interview format that has been um, attended by Tim Berners-Lee and many other uh, interesting personalities of the web. And today here I have with me uh, Una, Una Krivitz. She is a senior developer engineer at Google. Give it up for Una. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm definitely no uh, Tim Berners-Lee, but hopefully I could answer some questions and teach you all a little bit today. All right. So uh, let's start with this. You are uh, working as DevRel engineer at Google. Let's start with um, DevRel. There is a lot of confusion uh, everywhere about what is DevRel. Uh, can you tell us in, in short... In, yeah, in short, what you th what is for you DevRel? Yeah, I think it really depends on the team that you're working on, the company you're working on. Um, for me and my team, I work on Chrome where we focus on CSS, UI, and dev tools. And so what DevRel does is it makes sure that Chrome and Chromium, the platform engineers, are building things that developers care about. So we are all developers, we listen to the community, we talk to you, you hopefully will be telling us what you're struggling with, and then we bring that back to the team and help prioritize the work that they're doing on the platform. And at the same time, we help to finalize the syntax of APIs. We are in the working groups, uh, CSS working group and open UI working group, the HTML working groups. It depends on whatever people are working on. Um, and so we make sure that it makes sense for developers to use. And then we make sure that you all as a community know about it. So as things are landing, we wanna make sure that we're telling people about these APIs so that they're aware of it. Basically just helping people do their job as they build on the web platform. So for our team, DevRel is very much a connector position between the web platform and the community. Yes, all right. So it all treats around helping others, helping people understand what, what, what it is that you're doing and what um, what you can do with what yes. you're doing. So we might be building libraries or tools or demos or giving talks or even just working through the standards process. It's a very uh, unique role that pretty much changes every day, like what we're doing. <laughs> yes, and I, also it all, I think it also changes a lot uh, according to where you work, which type of company and which type yes. of, of product even uh, you're working. All right, so what other projects do you work uh, at or on uh, besides the uh, Google DevTools? So, uh, yeah, my team covers Google DevTools, which is just making sure that you have what you need to debug in the browser. Um, and we also work on APIs around CSS and HTML. So working with the CSS working group, uh, if you come to my talk today, it's at 1630 on the web stage. I'll be talking about some of the new APIs that are landing in the browser. Um, and then we, I'm also a member of the Open UI community group, which focuses on the intersection of CSS and HTML. So thinking about how can we make things easier to build? And what I mean by things is components, drop down menus, things like the pop up API, um, things like anchor positioning. So connecting two different elements together on the page, anchoring them. These are all different components that you need to build interfaces, and um, hopefully we can provide some tools so you don't have to rebuild the same things over and over and over again in five different frameworks. So that's sort of the idea of OpenUI and then also with the CSS Working Group. It's just simplifying these needs and injecting them into the web platform. Amazing. Well, what would you say is the biggest challenge in figuring stuff like that out? Naming things. <laughs> Naming things. Ah, naming things. Um, I, I think that it honestly is a challenge with naming things because not only is it like naming a function, you're naming the function that everybody will use when they're building that thing. So, yeah, that's definitely a challenge. So, so working through the process, too, it takes a long time. Yeah, so I, I imagine like coming up with these descriptive names that are not as long, but it has to be descriptive. So sometimes it's make don't know what don't know what don't know what for don't know what thing. i mean yeah it's also like when should something be an attribute versus a new element there's 
there's so many options for how to build things into the platform that making those decisions of ergonomics is a is a question. Well, what is an uh, an interesting anecdote you can tell us about like a naming thing, something like funny or something that's curious? I will say like one of the more annoying ones was um, with container queries, for example, that's an API that developers have requested for a long time. And so um, me and many other people started building with them and educating people about how to use container queries a year ago. And since then, the syntax has changed. So we're no longer using the container shorthand to just have the type of container. Now the container shorthand requires the container name first and then the container type. So all of the old demos that used container for the container type are broken. So I had to go and email or message like the first five Google search pages of articles about container queries, email the authors and ask them to update their articles because the syntax updated. And so that happens sometimes when it's experimental APIs. But now it's stable. Now it's in Chrome 105 and Safari 16, so it won't change again. Okay, that's good to know. Amazing. Um, tell us, Una, what excites you about uh, design and UI? W what is it that draws you to towards that, uh, that field? It's everywhere. I mean, every single person here works with interfaces. Every single app has a user interface. Every single experience that's physical has some kind of user feedback. And so I think that it is such a critical part of the web and it's so underrated. People definitely need to think more about how their experience works, the ergonomics of that experience. The biggest differentiator, especially in new industries, is UX. Like when we look at, you know, even in the web three world, it's the same underlying technology. It's the UX that makes people use it or not. And I feel like this is an area that people, especially as they learn to code, especially if they're learning in like boot camps, tend to kind of push off and ignore. And you can start seeing these impacts in our industry where you have like really just heavy spaghetti code, especially in the UI space, because people don't want to, they don't want to go into it. Um, and so for me, I'm really passionate about making things better for users and doing that through making developers understand how to make it easier to build interfaces. Um, and yeah, it's just so ubiquitous. Everywhere has, has some interesting problem to solve that is a user experience related problem. Nice, that's true. So you say you're drawn because every, everything has it. And with that also comes, since it's everywhere, it also has to be accessible. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say are current day um, accessibility problems that are yet to be solved by web UI? There's so many. Um, I mean, I think that the open UI group is really trying to solve accessibility by not making developers have to think about it. Because right now, developers have to rebuild a lot of components. If you want to style a dropdown, if you want to add like a flag or make the background pink when you hover it, you have to rebuild the entire experience out of divs. And when you do so, you have to add the correct aria. You have to have the correct focus indicators. You have to have the correct escape mechanisms. And it's so hard to do that right that no, almost nobody does it right. And so I think the best way to improve accessibility and make it easier for people to use websites, and not just people, but when I talk about accessibility, I'm also talking about people parsing your site, whether it's robots or people accessing your site, not on a browser in some other ways. The best way to do that is to make the primitives accessible by default so that people don't have to go in and add their own layers on top of it. Make it harder for people to mess up. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, especially because when you learn web development, when you just get started, the first thing you do, you learn HTML. And there it's already, um, you have to know, to you have to learn the correct, like, uh, tags. The semantics, right. The semantics, you have to get the semantics right. And if you have a course that, that isn't built for that, it's already going to be wrong from then further on. And that's just the first step of web development. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, come back a little bit. Um, to your career, we say you're, you're a senior DevRel engineer at Google. How did you uh, how did you end up as DevRel engineer at Google? 
it's, I think it's been a journey. Um, so I guess I started in this industry about 10 years ago and I, I was a UI engineer. So I was working in the front end space for most of my career, working on interfaces, working in design systems. I, I was working on product and managing product across like a shared component system with multiple endpoints. So I had about seven years of experience of working in the field. At the same time, I was always really interested in the community, attending local meetups. I organized workshops. I, I taught people how to use SaaS. I was really involved in the SaaS community uh, years ago. And so I think it sort of started from there where I was involved in the community. I had a blog. I would write articles about the things I was experimenting with and the open source tooling I was building while I was learning it. Um, and then I started speaking at conferences and going to events and it kind of grew from there. And eventually, uh, somebody from Google reached out to me about an opening for an opportunity on the material design team doing DevRel full time. And I've never done it full time before. So I was like, might as well give it a go, turn my hobby into my job. Um, and here I am three and a half years later and I love it. And, um, uh, I don't, I don't know what else I'd want to do. I really love it. I love it. Wow, cool. So it, it seems like uh, when you're a developer and uh, you, you're sort of com very good at communicating yourself, you automatically end up in DevRel. I, I've seen that a lot, especially on Twitter over the last two years, where people just good developers and they know how to communicate themselves. They sort of slip into that. that seems, same thing happened to me. I wasn't looking for that. I just sort of was offered and I accepted and here, here I am. <laughs> it is, it's very different than software engineering. And I actually know a lot of DevRel who have gone back to software engineering, where they tried it for a little time and they decided, you know, not for me. I just want to focus on building apps or whatever they're focusing on building. So it's definitely different because it's a lot more process. Like I talked about standards before. That's, it's not fun to sit in committees and talk about syntax all the time. And you still do get to code, so you get to do like yep. a little bit of everything, but it's definitely a unique role. Um, if you're interested in community organization, and it really also depends on where you're working as DevRel, I'd recommend giving it a go, but you can always go back to software engineering or development. and It's fluid. I've seen people go both ways. Yeah. All right. So you said you, you've been working as a UI engineer like since... 10 years ago, what is something that you don't miss about the UI back 10 years ago to compare to now? Everything is different now. It's so much easier to build things now. I mean, 10 years ago, you had to use ClearFix to remove floats. You were using image maps for anything that was non-normative. Yeah. Um, it's a completely different world. I mean, Flexbox and Grid changed everything. And now with Subgrid, now with container queries, now with the has selector, it's like we're in a whole new era of, of UI. Like it's like every 10 years ish, things really change. And right now things are going through a revolution again for responsive design. Wow, that's fantastic. So you mentioned already a few things, but uh, what are the hottest new things coming to web UI in the next maybe year or two? There's so many. Um, I will start with things that already landed this year. So this year, Cascade Layers landed across all browsers. And that is a new entry point in the CSS Cascade, which wasn't something you could do before. Now you can add in, and inject layers into your UI and control the architecture and precedence of your code. So that was a nice CSS architecture update. Um, we also got accent color earlier this year when it was landed in Safari now across all browsers. Um, that lets you inject styles into the native form control themes in your browser. I'll talk more about this in my talk later today, um, which wasn't something that we could do before. We have auto color schemes in the browser. Um, and then also things that are sort of partially implemented in some browsers, not others, but are huge is has which is a selector that lets you select either the parent element based on its children or any states in the children or any sibling inside of that same element. You could do crazy things with this. Like you could do um, not, like transforming the entire page in like two lines of code. It's really cool. Um, and container queries, which I briefly mentioned earlier, and that lets you inject styles 
and logic into elements themselves. So you can write a size-based logical query on the element and have it live anywhere. The sidebar, the hero, any page, and know that it's resilient and have tested it for all possible permutations. Um, so that's a really big one. And then uh, scroll linked animations are a really cool one that I, I, not, I don't even have a chance to talk about it today because there's just so much landing. Um, but scroll linked experiences and things that like come in and then attaching scroll to a, uh, attaching animations to a scroll and not just timing. Um, and then a lot of the open UI stuff like select menu component, um, at the pop-up attribute, which you could put on any element and create a pop-up experience, like a tooltip, um, and then also anchor positioning to connect components and make sure that the anchored element stays on the screen with a set of anchor points, like an anchor set. That's another thing that OpenUI is currently discussing, but those are more experimental and the APIs for those might change. Wow, awesome. So it's a little bit, I see across the board, it's not just one thing, but it's robustness, it's easy, easier yes. for developers to do it, but also like beautiful things like scrolling and having a nice animation there. I, I think I saw on your Twitter a, uh, a demo of, of something like that where the, the image gets rounded corners when you scroll. Yeah, yeah, so that was an ex a demo from Jay Tompkins on our team and um, the, the clipping mask shifted as you moved through the page. So it enabled this like, effect of things kind of popping in in different places. And you could also do horizontal scrollers. You could really do a lot with the scrolling animations. Have, have you seen the website of Remix? They have a pretty cool website with, when you scroll, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I, I think that's amazing. I don't even know if I could ever do that. It's, it's something that seems well, impossible to me. Well, hopefully this API would make it easier for you to do that so that you don't have to have additional dependencies. You don't have to have all of this extra code. It would just be native in the browser. All right, cool. So you told us a few things that are coming now, but what, uh, according to you, are things that are still missing and are still not planned for modern web browsers? I think that there's a couple of things. Um, one is the app property API that that's implemented in two browsers now, but it is not planned yet for a third. And it is so cool because you can create custom properties and give them syntax, semantic meaning. So it lets you do things like animate gradients, which the browser renders as images because you're now injecting meaning and breaking up those values. It lets you create any kind of syntax. So you could have uh, custom identifiers, you could have percents. Uh, that's, a, I think, a really important one that we should be prioritizing more. And then also an attribute function that can actually read semantic value. So right now we can pull attributes from the DOM and print them as strings, but we can't do that in CSS. Like you can't pull in those values, like say the color red and use it as a color. It thinks it's a string. So you, you have an issue there. And so I think a more advanced attribute function would be really helpful. Um, and also more advanced color functions. This is another one that we're discussing in the CSS working group is color contrast. So doing an auto color contrast value where you would set a, a range of colors and then have the browser pick the most optimal color contrast or meet a certain contrast ratio. Um, more advanced color and color functions I think are really interesting and also being discussed right now. Wow, amazing. I know, you asked me for yeah. one thing, and I'm like, I could list yeah, like five. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's, that's good, that's, that's fantastic. Um, damn it, what did I want to ask? I had a question in mind. Um, oh yes, CSS art. <laughs> Have you ever done CSS art? Because I see people do amazing things with it. H have you experimented with that? I have done like animated SVGs. But the CSS art or like the one div thing that uh, there are some incredibly talented people out there who do that. I haven't done. And it takes a long time. It's it's yeah. basically like thousands of divs and you add gradients and clipping masks and like create pieces. And I've seen like the Mona Lisa recreated in art. It's it's pretty cool, but definitely not practical. <laughs> just just for fun. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, 
a two-part question. Do you have uh, side projects you're currently working on? And if yes, what's your favorite side project? Oh, I feel like I don't really have as much time anymore for side projects as I used to. Um, a while ago, when CSS blend modes were newer, I, I created a project called CSS Gram, and it was like Instagram using CSS. So that was a fun one. Right now, I'm working on a invitation designer because I'm a calligrapher also. I do like invitation design. And um, I'm working on like a template generator basically that lets you design things based on a set of templates, but all in the browser. Because right now there's like two products that do it and they're really expensive. So I thought I would just create a free one for people who are in the space of invitation design. That's what I'm working on now, but just for fun. Well, I'm looking forward to, to your product. Um, so I think you are, we are running almost out of time, but we still have a few minutes left. So I, I get back, back to something that's not uh, tech related, but just something that I, I think is equally important. Um, you work life balance. How do you manage that? That's, that's a great question. Um, you tell me, I'm still working on it. <laughs> no, I think that, I think for me, I used to be a lot worse about it. And as I have grown older, I have realized the importance of just preserving your sanity because you will burn out if you are spending all your weekends writing talks and, and just doing too much. Um, it's hard because in this industry, I feel like a lot of people are very passionate. So they want to work on open source projects or personal side projects or other things. But taking time, spending time with your family, my dog has really helped me to focus on the present and take time away from the computer. And, and I think I've gotten just a little bit better about it and thinking actively about work-life balance and taking time away. What type of dog do you have? He's a mini golden doodle. His name is Disco, like the dance. <laughs> cool. Okay, one last question and then I let you go. Um, someone that wants to get into tech or is more specific into UI, what is one great advice you can give them? Well, what really worked for me was attending conferences like this, um, going to your local meetups. So the community that's already around you, whether you're a student or whether you are um, a part of a city community group, that's the best way to really find people who are interested in the same types of things that you are and then work with them and build things with them. Like that's a great way to do it. Also, I encourage everyone to start a blog because I think that you have a unique way of talking about a subject. I started a blog just to remember how I did things, like public notes. And that grew and grew. And I think that that's a really great way to, A, have a history of what you're talking about. But also, if you are looking to like apply for jobs eventually, it's good to kind of have some way for your prospective employer to like see how you think. And also, if you are interested in talking at conferences or working on side projects, working at startups, like having some kind of history of how you've grown and learned is really helpful. So I think if you're newer to this field, start writing about your experiences and also continue to kind of be in these communities. There's also online communities now. So there's a lot of discord groups. Um, and I think that's where I find a lot of inspiration for this role. Marvelous. All right. So I think we're at the end of our talk. Uh, thank you so much, Una, uh, for coming, and of course for you, uh, the, quest, uh, the answers to our questions. And yes, everyone, come to Una's talk at 4:30 today. Yes, on, on the web stage. On the web stage. All right, give it up for Una. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.